Good evening, uh, Advocate Zisman. Good evening, Chief Justice and Commissioners. In your own words, very briefly, um, why do you believe you're ready for appointment? Uh, Chief Justice, I think I'm ready. Uh, I've been practicing now 26 years as an advocate. I've been there as a magistrate for about eight years or seven years. And uh, I think it's time for me to uh, do my best to deliver my part to the, to the judiciary. Um, and I think I've got the necessary experience to do that. And I, at the age, I think that I need to take a new step in the law. Well, on a lighter note, I want you to be warned that I'm three months older than you. <laughs> yes. JP? Thank you. Good evening, Advocate Zitzman. JP. You have had several stints at our bench, haven't you? Yes, indeed. I think it's the fourth or the fifth stint I uh, had now the last term. How did you find it? Acting um, in our division. I can, what I can say, Chief Justice, is that since our JP has been appointed, everything went uh, was running very smooth at our division <clears throat> because everything was arranged properly and our role is arranged properly and I found it very uh, comfortable to, to work together with other colleagues that I, had, that I met at the, at the High Court. Uh, not that it was uh, previously not so good, although it was not so good arranged as it is now. And uh, I'm getting along with all, all the judges in the Free State High Court, even the acting judges. On average, how long does it take you to uh, deliver your reserved judgments? Um, I think the, light, the, the, the one that I did, the, the, that took the longest was about two weeks. Two weeks. You had occasion to do circuit court duties? I did circuit court duties in Harry Smith and uh, in uh, Kwakwa. <clears throat> so experience did you cope? Did cope. Um, I've got the necessary experience in criminal cases as well, although a bit rusty because I've been long practicing as an advocate. To pick it up quite quickly, it's uh, like riding a bicycle, as they say. <clears throat> Thank, you, Thank you, CJ. Thank you, JP. Premier. Afternoon, uh, advocate. Um, I see in, in 2009, the President of the Republic appointed you as Senior Counsel for the Republic of South Africa. Indeed. As a special token of the President's trust and confidence in your fidelity. And they say this appointment is indicative of a perceived ability, impeccable standard mature judgment, member, membership qualities, and respect for your peers. Now, the Black Lawyers Association says, indeed, you are very competent, but for the sake of transformation, um, at this stage, we should not be considered. What, what is your view? How will you address those issues <coughs> Mr. of Mr. transformation? Chief Justice, um, From the outside, I think <clears throat> uh, the fact that I'm a white male won't, won't contribute to the transformation <clears throat> to our bench. However, I think from the inside uh, and subject to our constitution and taking what our constitution says, what we must do, um, I can bring the necessary experience to the bench and on that basis, I think I can <coughs> contribute to transformation to our bench. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, Honorable uh, Malema, before he posed this question, I think he has been posing a question as to how many languages uh, can you speak? Can you speak any Sotho or Tswana or
I had stood to, uh, on sc at school <coughs> as a subject. My wife was also a teacher in northern, northern Sutu, although I cannot speak Sutu, <coughs> but I know a lot of words in Sutu. Uh, and uh, <coughs> because you don't use the language on a regular basis, you, you don't learn to speak it. So I unfortunately can't speak it. Um, but <coughs> to add to that, I think that's the reason why we, <coughs> I'm not English speaking either, <coughs> but that's the reason why I think uh, we need a common language like English to bridge those diversities and to come together in a, in a way. And I think that's the reason why uh, our bar also uh, adopted a resolution to make English the official language of our bar in the Free State. Do you know but I, some little uh, simple Dumela greetings? And yeah, Dumela, Kitang, Okai, and <coughs> uh, what, uh, the most interesting and descriptive word I've learned uh, is the word Tse. <coughs> tse, and it's a specific way you pronounce it, <coughs> especially in, in criminal cases. <coughs> tse, <coughs> it's, it's a descriptive word. <coughs> <clears throat> it's a descriptive word in, in the senses that you normally get, uh, especially in rape cases, <clears throat> where the accused would cross-examination, uh, was cross-examined through his attorney or an advocate to the complainant, <clears throat> um, telling her or putting it to the complainant uh, that he had sexual intercourse with her with her consent. Then you get the answer. See. <laughs> Then you know is is not only a no, but also you lying. <laughs> so that's a very descriptive word. <laughs> <Sutu. clears throat> thank, you, thank you, advocate. And do you speak uh, Sesotho to, do you have any Sesotho speaking employees? I've got uh, Sesotho speaking employees, but I, no, I hear the Sesotho. words, but I, if you don't speak a language every day, then you, you, you don't learn it. And I, I was I've, just wondering, why don't you talk to him or her in Sesotho? I must do that. So I, you can practice. I can practice on that basis, yes. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Commissioner Malema? Do you support transformation? Yes, uh, Chief Justice. I, tra I, I support transformation. <coughs> and I've, I think we've proved it in our bar in the Free State that we are busy transforming and we're doing our utmost to do uh, such whatever is necessary to transform. <coughs> As an SC, have you taken uh, juniors, black juniors? Yes, I have. I've had Seapi Mutlong as a black junior in our bar. I had Lungile <coughs> Bumela. I had Lawrence Manye. <coughs> I had um, Mene. <coughs> no, not in your bar. Uh, in some complicated, serious cases that you have done. That's not my bar. When you are briefed on a case I, to do? Yes, then I, the, then I had at least uh, three or four times black juniors at my bar <laughs> as my junior. <clears throat> now, because of your support for transformation, if you are given a task to choose three people, there are three white Afrikaner males and two African blacks and one African female, what do you do? Because you are a supporter of uh, transformation. Let's not forget that. Well, one must understand that I'm in the bar. In other words, first and foremost, I get briefed from attorneys. I don't tell the attorneys who to brief. I must accept briefs from attorneys. And then on that basis, if a junior is needed, I would ask the <coughs> attorney to, if it's possible, to appoint a junior. Sir, Council, we are answering the question I didn't ask. I'm saying, 
as a support of transformation, yes. you are given a task to choose three people, not those things of briefing, for a, re for a responsibility, for judges. You are sitting there where the CJ is sitting. You are given a task. Here are three people, six people. Yes. They've all conducted very successfully good interviews. They are super. Out of these six, there are three Afrikaner males, two African males, and one female. Talking about the appointment here as judges. No, not here. I'm giving you a scenario. Okay. Six people, you must choose three. Out of six, there are three Afrikaner males, three African males, one female. As a supporter of transformation, who will you choose out of these six? I'll choose the most competent black guy. No, no, we must choose three. Remember, there are six. So you must choose three of the, out of the six. Yes, there are six, three Afrikaner males, white males, two black males, and one black female. If I have to go for transformation, I would at least make sure that a black female is chosen, one black man is chosen, and the most experienced uh, black uh, white male is, 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 is chosen. <coughs> no, thank you very much. I think that uh, with regard to the Sotho thing that the Premier raised with you, will you, after this discussion, be taking an effort to start trying to engage with whoever you come across as a Sotho speaking person to speak in Sotho. I will do so, <clears throat> Chief Justice. Thank you. Uh, JP. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Uh, Advocate Zitzman Dumel. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to to deal with your transformation uh, outlook. Uh, Councillor Malema has asked you some of those questions. Commissioner Malema, I'm sorry. Um, some years ago, I sat as a judge moderator in the National Bank uh, Council Examination Board. NBEB, I think that's what it's called. Yes. And my experience throughout the country was that the most people who failed were black. Um, but in particular, the Free State. The Free State was interviewed in Houting. The Free State always struggled to attract a good number of black pupils. Has that situation changed? That situation has changed, Chief Justice. <coughs> The reason previously why we didn't uh, attract black uh, advocates was mostly because it's obviously difficult to start without an income, <clears throat> especially that first six months or year peopleship. And then <clears throat> when they started, uh, they don't get paid uh, fast enough, and then they get lucrative offers from outside uh, to take up jobs outside. <clears throat> that uh, we tried to change by way of engaging with the attorneys, the law society, with briefing patterns. We tried to engage it by way of uh, talks with the state attorney and the RAF <coughs> to, get, um, to get more briefs to black advocates so that they can uh, try to get a more lucrative practice in that way, affording their own bar fees. That I think is starting to, to work because uh, the state attorney is presently mostly briefing uh, black advocates at the bar. The RAF are mostly the black advocates, although, the, although they're not always paying fast enough. We have a problem with that as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for instance, uh, at the Law Society's uh, year in function last year, I know that our judge president was the guest speaker and she. And she asked the attorneys there to please make an effort 
to brief black advocates in the Free State Bar so that we can advance this. Um, <clears throat> it did work, and we have pres presently, we can only take four or five pupils at any year because of our capacity, and we have presently uh, got one uh, white guy, uh, one Indian guy, and two black women as pupils this year, which, which will finalize the pupilship within the next month. So, so, so the, the last two to three changed. years, there's, there's a, advance, uh, a vast improvement on, on, on that. Okay. No, I think that's, that's good to know. Um, in terms of the areas in which you specialize that you set out in 2.7, um, do black advocates get that kind of work? You say general litigation, sequestrations and liquidations as well as uh, they, these are cases that require an intimate knowledge of the National Credit Act and the Consumer Pro Pro Protection Act. You mentioned other acts. Does this kind of work goes to go to black uh, advocates? Presently, not in the Free State Bar, <clears throat> to be honest. Um, uh, except if you, if you get in the junior and if there's money from the attorney side and the client side, that you can get in a junior. <clears throat> to have that, uh, to get that necessary experience. Uh, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> the bigger <clears throat> attorney firm, uh, attorney firms does not engage <clears throat> uh, less experienced persons, never mind whether they're black or white, but they go for the more experienced persons in, in order to get the, those type of work done, because it's not, it's not easy work. It's difficult work. <clears throat> okay, so that's why it's remained in white hands. It, yeah, it, it, uh, mostly, and uh, but it's not the end of the world. I think there's there's a way forward. I think okay. there's a way that we can try if the briefing patterns is stabilised. Yes, can try to get black advocates to join in that ranks. <clears throat> have you done pro bono work? I have. <clears throat> I haven't got statistics here now, but I have. In what kind of work areas? Uh, opinions. Uh, what? Opinion, opinions. Uh, and I've done, um, I've given lectures to the university uh, in insolvency law. And uh, <clears throat> Have you accepted work from the legal aid? When I was a junior, yes, but not at the later, later years. Okay. Thank you, CJ. No other question. Thank you, JP. Commissioner Nyambi. Thank you, CJ. Evening. <clears throat> Mine is in relation to the last interview with the JSC. Yes. Anything that you think uh, has changed that you might want to reconsider and clarify today? With regard to my previous interviews? I don't think so. <clears throat> There's not, nothing I can think of that needs to be clarified. Um, at that stage, I think our bench was not properly transformed, and I accept that was the biggest reason why I was not appointed at that stage. We are now presently, I think, one of the benches in the country that uh, uh, are properly transformed, and uh, <clears throat> that's the difference between then and now in my view. And I think it is a, it is a fact that uh, transformation is part of our legal uh, fraternity in our legal in our bench, which must be performed. But we must not forget, <clears throat> in my view, that experience is just as important uh, in that instance. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know whether there's anything specific you want to refer to regarding the previous interview. <clears throat> Maybe if you can take... Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'll ask a specific thing. Maybe if you can take us through the doctrine of separation of powers. Doctrine of separation of powers. Well, the Constitution makes provision for the for the separation of powers <clears throat> insofar as um, the legal or the courts on the one hand 
the executive on the other end is concerned, <coughs> the parliament. And uh, <coughs> the constitution defines precisely which part of, of the, uh, uh, which entity, what, if I can call it an entity, should do what, <coughs> and <coughs> it's all subject to the constitution. And neither of those parties are supposed uh, to do anything unlawfully if it's against the constitution. <coughs> and on that basis, there must be a separation of powers so that the courts, for the instance, can overlook what, what the parliament is doing on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, that the parliament can, can look that the court is doing their work, <coughs> not interfering with it, but on that basis, uh, a separation of powers between all the three uh, different instances. Do judges make law? Sorry? Judges make law. Do judges make law? Yes, yes judges make law. <coughs> In what way? Sorry? In what way? Well, <coughs> the Constitution makes provision that, that the common law must be extended or expanded. Developed. Or developed, that's the correct word. Sorry, Chief Justice. And <coughs> uh, according to the needs of the day, and, and uh, that's... For instance, one part of, of where courts makes law, um, and um, courts have to interpret acts, so in that instance it also makes law, um, and uh, it establishes the common law, um, and on that basis it makes law, <coughs> but it not, does not make acts, it doesn't make statutes. Uh, as, as if that is what you mean. <clears throat> is it right for politicians to criticize judges? If it's fair criticism, it might be uh, it might be according to the constitution insofar as it's fair comment. Everyone has got the right to his own comment, but if it's unfair, Obviously, uh, um, it, it, it boils down to a content of court, which uh, sometimes happens. <coughs> and uh, I don't think it's then uh, to be allowed. Possible to clarify it in a form of example? If, if a politician makes a comment <coughs> on a judgment by a judge without having the facts to his disposal. <clears throat> that will be a contempt of court. If he does have all the facts and he differs <clears throat> with the interpretation of the facts, it might be a different issue. But if he, if he differs <clears throat> from the conclusion in law or in other words, if he doesn't have the facts, or if, if he differs in the conclusion of the law, he would obviously not be entitled to comment on the, judge, uh, on the judge's uh, judgment. <clears throat> Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner Nyambi. Um, for those co colleagues who may wish to raise their hands still, I just want to say I've got six remaining to, to put questions. So I thought it was necessary to signify. Dr. Mutseka. Okay, did you study the history of law? I did, <coughs> Chief Justice. I, I studied at UNISA. <coughs> I can't hear. I studied at UNISA uh, years ago, <laughs> uh, and I think in 1970, 1980, until 1989. I studied uh, all the subjects there, okay, no, that's including that. the history. <clears throat> no, I'm answered uh, because I also studied the history of law at UNISA yes. and came to the conclusion that uh, English law, common law, is a collection of the customs of the English people. Roman Dutch law is a collection of the customs of the Roman and the Dutch people. Yes. And uh, African law 
is also a collection of the customs of African people. Can you tell me why, when we talk about English, we talk about common law, Roman Dutch law, but when we come to Africa, we, say, we still say customary law. Is that not discrimination in the status of the laws? I never thought about it on that basis, Chief Justice. <coughs> um, I don't think it's discriminatory. I mean, it's a question of how it was called. Um, it's not a question of, of customary law to be not common law. Do you believe in transformation? Sorry? Do you believe in transformation? Yes, I do. Why don't you want to transform cust African customary law to a law and leave out custom like we, it was we, done? Yeah, we can do that. As, we can call it common law as well. And that's part of the development of the common law, which our constitution makes provision for. Have you studied uh, indigenous African law? I did. Well, I had a subject on Tunisia on it. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Ndoni. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yabon, I guess that's why Zauti. Sorry. Saubon. Saubon. And it takes me away from evening, afternoon, morning. Yes. yes. In your, in your last interview, you, you spoke about a body system which was meant to assist junior counsel and for the benefit of the commissioners. Can you please explain what your body system was in the... Oh, the body the, system. Mm. Now we, we had a system, uh, we still had to have that system in, in which we put the most 10 junior uh, advocates on a list, but that's including whites as well as blacks the most 10 junior advocates on a list. <coughs> and then uh, we call that the buddy system. And then each time that a senior advocate <coughs> um, is involved in a, in a difficult matter in which he needs a, a junior advocate, but he does, the attorney doesn't have the money to, to uh, pay for a junior advocate as well, <coughs> then he contact the junior advocate on the list uh, not at random, but we mark it down as, as each one is chosen and then the next one is taken <coughs> on the basis to assist the senior advocate at a portion of the senior advocate's fee, which is normally 5% per hour of the fee of the senior advocate. That was because of the fact that the senior advocate needed a cer a certain help uh, on an investigative basis but also to help learn the junior advocate to get more experience in, in, in whatever the senior advocate is, is doing. <clears throat> That's our buddy system. <clears throat> and has, has that system... Uh, it's still in place. It's it still working. Place? It's still in place and it's working. Um, and I must say, <clears throat> since about two years ago, as I have pointed out earlier, uh, the RAF is presently engaging in briefing black advocates at our bar, as well as the state attorney, which, which make it, made a huge difference. So they get the necessary experience, <clears throat> and they, they get the necessary exposure uh, on that basis. So the, that's even a more or better situation for transformation at our bar presently than the buddy system. But we do still have the buddy system. Currently, how many... Advocates, do you have at the bar? I think it's 69. <clears throat> and, and how many of those are black? I think it's 12. <laughs> 12 black and I think one colored. 12 or 13, I'm not exactly sure, but it's 12 or 13. Okay, thank you. And what are the constitutional constraints uh, on the powers of the judiciary? <clears throat> um, Chief Justice, <coughs> um, I don't know, I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly, but um, <coughs> the Constitution makes provision for the courts to look after 
acts of Parliament, which is unlawful, that including the High Court and the ECA, <coughs> uh, as well as to any law that is unlawful, which is uh, contrary to the Constitution. I don't know whether I understand the question correctly. Whether the question is whether, as as judiciary, are there any constraints to the powers of the judiciary? I don't think so. I don't think so because the Constitution makes provision for for those powers. Uh, I, I can't think of any constraints. Is above the law. So the justice is not above the law. <clears throat> now everyone is equal before the law. <clears throat> are they constrained by the same constitution that they are cutting? They are using to cut other arms of government? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't understand the question clearly, <laughs> but they are. <clears throat> Commissioner Semenya. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Semenya. There is an advocate, Coco, yes. who is a member of the Kimberley Bar. Yes. I'm told that he came to apply for membership to the Free State Bar to which you are the chair. Yes. And as the story goes, and please tell me if it is wrong, he was initially accepted for membership. Yes. The membership was later rescinded on the basis, as I'm told, you held that there is a disciplinary proceedings pending against him in Kimberley. He went back to Kimberley and Kimberley said they have no such knowledge of a disciplinary matter pending against him. <coughs> he came back to you to say so and to inquire from you whether you are able to give him the nature of the complaint alleged against him. And your response was that since he was not your member, you are not going to entertain that request. He must go back to Kimberley. Is there truth in that story? There is a part truth there. Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> but not the whole truth. Mr. Coco is a member at the Kimberley Bar. He applied for dual membership at our bar. Not to leave Kimberley, but to ask, to ask for dual membership at our bar. We informed him that it is in order. He can start becoming a member as soon as we get a letter of good standing from the Kimberley Bar. That letter was outstanding for months. And I was informed by the chairperson of the Kimberley Bar, Mr. Johan van Nikerk, that there are two or three pending investigations against Mr. Koko. That's the history of it. At a stage, those investigations were not finalized. And again, I again contacted Mr. van Nikerk, and he informed me that, <clears throat> that one or two pending investigations was withdrawn by them and he'll give me a letter of good standing as soon as Mr. Coco pays his bar fees which he did. I, uh, I received a letter of good standing from Mr. Fanica, informed Mr. Coco that he's now free to start to take up membership as from the 1st of September this year. <clears throat> On the 26th of August this year Mr. Coco appeared in the Bloomerland High Court whilst I was acting, not before me, before another acting judge, <clears throat> against a member of the Free State Bar. And during that appearance, <clears throat> I received a letter from Honey and Partners attorneys with serious allegations as to his conduct. <clears throat> I referred the letter to the Kimberley Bar because he was not a member as yet at our bar. I informed the attorney's firm, as well as the Kimberley Bar, that there is a letter complaining about Mr. Coco's conduct, which is of a serious nature, amongst others, that he um, 
misguided or misled the judge who was also acting judge at our division at that stage. That was the allegation. <coughs> now, obviously, um, <coughs> when this was sent to Kimberley Bar, <coughs> I received a fax from the Kimberley Bar to say on the same day that <coughs> whilst there is a pending a complaint, they would not issue a new letter of good standing for him until that complaint is finalized. I informed Mr. Nkoko after my whole bar council decided on that, that including Mr. Manye and all the AFT members <coughs> of my bar council, that <coughs> we should write the letter to him to say, listen, you can take up membership as soon as that complaint is finalized against you, that investigation. Because you're not a member with us, it must be investigated by the Kimberley Bar where you are a member. That's what I informed him. Then Mr. Koko started threatening me, sending me an email to say, if I don't accept him as a, as a member at our bar, he will make sure that this information is conveyed to the JEC. Then again, my bar council sat on it. I withdrew myself from the bar council because I was one of the candidates to, to sit here today. I withdrew myself from the bar council at that stage, approximately two weeks ago. And my bar council decided to take him in as a member on the basis that if he's found guilty of that complaint or that uh, complaint against him, his membership will terminate. And that is from the 1st of October this year. So presently, Mr. Koko is a, uh, was accepted by my bar council on that condition. And what could be the explanation for the Free State Bar Council to interrogate a complaint in respect of a person who is not their member? the meeting to which you recused yourself, and perhaps you might even explain to me why another judge in the Free State would uh, place with you a complaint in respect of a member who is not of the Free State Bar. Sorry, Chief Judge, I didn't understand the question, but <clears throat> uh, at, at my Bar Council, we did not interrogate Mr. Koku. No, entertain a dispute around him when he is not a member of your bar. No, we did not entertain the dispute. That's the reason why we say you must go back to the Kimberley bar so that they can entertain the dispute or the complaint, investigate it, and whatever they find, we'll accept. And then he can become a member, because he was not a member at that stage. You must remember, we did not accept him as a member. We informed him that he can become a member on the 1st of September. <coughs> um, so he has not been a member of our bar when the complaint was laid. And therefore, I referred the complaint to his bar where he was a member, being the Kimberley Bar, or the Northern Cape Bar. <coughs> and uh, obviously, I informed the attorney, attorneys who complained as well, so that they can take it up with the Kimberley Bar from there on. I have a personal motto that says democracy works when uh, we meet out the fairest treatment to the worst amongst us. Would you associate yourself with that motto? Sure, Chief Justice. Beg your pardon? Yes. Now, one of the useful purposes of high court judgments is that they guide the magistracy in relation to matters of law, right? Yes. I, I, I have had an occasion to read their judgment in the Gagiono matter, one of the cases that you have attached to your application. Yes. All right. It is written in Afrikaans. Yes. But surely that would make it of some limited use to the magistrates in the free state who are not Africans competent, wouldn't it? Indeed, it, it will. And uh, 
Chief Justice, I think that was written in 2011, if I'm not wrong. Um, all the parties before me were Afrikaans speaking. Um, and obviously, um, uh, all the pleadings were in Afrikaans, and I deem it, deemed it necessary to, to give their judgment to them in the, the language that they speak. But I do agree with you. Um, that it would not be helpful for magistrates and or even if it went on appeal uh, for someone to understand uh, Afrikaans, um, not necessarily. And I did from that stage, I think onwards, try to, uh, except for one or two occasions where I did also give a judgment in Afrikaans where I was asked to do it by the parties. Uh, gave my judgment normally in English uh, so that that possibility can be excluded that uh, judgment must be uh, translated for appeal purposes or that it does not help is not helpful for magistrates so I do take the point <coughs> and uh, I think I only attached it to refer to the fact that I can give an Afrikaans judgment firstly and secondly it was, a, 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 I think, an interesting type of case uh, for that purpose. Even more so, by parity of reasoning, it would seem to me that if litigants were, so to speak, so are the presiding officers and they keep the conduct of the matter in Sesotho, it might even exclude you in understanding judgments of your court. Yes, I do take the point. I have no further questions, Chair. Thank you, Advocate Semenya. Uh, Commissioner Nogesi. Thank you, Chief Justice. In fact, there are a few questions, too. Um, <coughs> on the last occasion, you yes. indicated that because of your expertise in commercial law, some judges would even call you and seek advice in deciding their cases. Is that st still the position? Are the judges still calling you in relation to the matters they are doing there at Free State? Chief Justice, that is not the case anymore. The last time I was here, you as the Chief Justice indicated to all the commissioners present, as well as Judge Musi was the JP at that stage, that it's unacceptable for a judge to call an advocate for advice. <clears throat> it did not happen thereafter. I took the point. Um, uh, I think you correct. However, I was in a situation where you, you normally can't say no when the judge is asking you questions. Um, so, so, and I always would try to be helpful, but uh, I think everyone took the point that you as chief judges made at that stage and that it never happened again. So it, because they were not here, so if they call you, you simply say, look, look, I don't want to, you, you chase them away. Well, I've never been called again. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I, obviously, if, I'm, if someone would call me again, and then I, w I would um, inform them of the chief justice's uh, view on it. And also you indicated that the big chunk of work in Free State is mainly commercial. That of is my work, yes. Of your work. <laughs> yes. And um, <clears throat> there are no black advocates, junior, that you rub into your work. I mean, you have already indicated that. Yeah, well, except if, if it's on the Barry system, but normally not, yes. Lastly, um, there is a uh, 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 there is a view that whenever you, when you communicate, I mean, as a chairperson of the bar, communicate with uh, with the people there, you always communicate in Afrikaans with them. Even in instances where there are those that cannot speak Afrikaans, you would communicate in Afrikaans. Well, that's not totally true, Mr. Chief Justice. Um, we, as I've indicated earlier. We took a decision, it's part of our policy of the Bar Council in the Free State, that our communication is always in English. 
between bar council members, between the bar council itself and members, and between members and the bar council. Um, and that is the situation since I think October last year, since I became the chairperson. Um, before that, it was uh, there was complaints about it. I know, but we took the decision on that stage, and since then, all communications are in English. Thank you, Commissioner Nokesi. Uh, Commissioner Kavasha. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, good evening, uh, Advocate. Good evening, Commissioner. Now, I, you have told us that you, you believe in transformation, yes? Yes, I do. Uh, and you would agree that um, understanding the social condition and living experiences of your fellow South Africans, and in particular black South Africans, informs how you implement transformation. You would agree with that? Yes. I am making the assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, that your social circles do not necessarily include associating with black persons so that you can learn to understand that social condition or those living experiences? Not so much as an advocate, but as, as a judge, it more occasionally happened uh, when I acted because we were colleagues and then we had various times where we had lunches together and even uh, functions uh, over weekends sometimes. So, so it happens at the bench or in the bench. I, I, I will. Sorry, on the on the bench. I, I will then still make the assumption that you really don't understand the social conditions of people in townships, in uh, squatter camps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, given that there's a vast amount of knowledge about these social conditions that has been written about, you know, I'm just trying to turn this thing around a bit and understand what somebody like you, an aspirant judge, would do to try and understand the experiences of black folk. My question is, do you then inform yourself by reading publications by black authors, be it Manja Langa, be it uh, Kaya Langa, be it you know, people who write about black yes, life. Yes. <clears throat> Do you collect books like that? Do you read that? Or I haven't book. I haven't got books like that, <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice. If I'm, if I become a judge, obviously, if the need arises, then obviously I would uh, uh, engage myself in in reading up on on that. But I, I'm a South African citizen. And I know the social, socio, uh, economics and social conditions. Um, although I was not, I was not uh, born and raised in in in, in a settlement. Um, I do have the necessary experience. You must remember, I'm almost well. I'm 55 years old. I, I've, I'm in South Africa since I was born. I know black people. I know the the conditions, or some of them, or some of the conditions. Um, but I I. If necessary, or if the need arises, then I would obviously engage myself in in reading up more fully. Really, just how you set about informing yourself of those particular persons to act within the next 20 years. And I was really just to turn the oh, debate and say, okay, are sources of information, video shows are sources of information. Um, how many white South Africans buy book published by black authors? about our social conditions, who write about our day-to-day -day existence. What I'm trying to understand how you in an imperative that you say you believe in. You know, that's no, really what the questions I, I, are trying I hear to what the is that we, since October last, when it became the papers our bar, little bar, was it you? We had to engage in various black advocates at our bar, advocates from other bars. And and on that basis, I interacted with them that I've got to learn. Um, come, um, not only 
But that, but I, as far as the, uh, I'm not talking about earlier years. <laughs> so, so I'm engaging in those talks, and, and I do understand the problems and the social, social, uh, historical problems. And uh, <laughs> get <coughs> on my bar council, especially because we got uh, half of our bar council, is, and we yes. we adopted the constitution here. You, you see, at the point about young good end, the things that you believe in and you believe in transformation. So it's not just about for your own purposes, understanding black people's living conditions uh, and social about, conditions. Yeah. Excuse me, one yeah, sorry. I'm almost there. It's also about you as a leader within society, within the bar, what you do to encourage the young people who you are able to influence to buy books. The de former Deputy CJ is about to publish a book, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Justice Musenek. Are you saying to young advocates, you must buy that book when it hits the shelves? Because you know the former DCJ. You yes, know, know. That's the type of thing I'm trying to explore. Well, I, what I can can say, uh, obviously, I will, if, if if I know about such a book that comes onto the shelf, I would encourage people to to buy it, or young advocates, especially white advocates. But you must remember when we, and I'm going back to the stage when the bar council and I had to decide to amend or adopt a new constitution. I had to convince. 60 advocates at the Free State Bar to adopt that constitution because our previous constitution uh, entailed that you had to be a two thirds quorum before a new constitution can be adopted. So I had to convince at least 46 advocates, including the white advocates, to vote for that new constitution. And I send out memos on a weekly basis to try and convince them. Um, I don't know whether I answered your question, Commissioner, but may, may what I I'm trying to do you? is I'm doing my utmost to, to, to uh, learn junior advocates, white advocates as well, that transformation is the correct way to go forward. And the students you, you lecture. I'm looking at your yes. question 10 on yes. your questionnaire. Mm. The question is, what would you regard as your most significant contribution to the law, one, mm. and the pursuit of justice mm. in South Africa, two? So these are two different yes. issues. Your answer is commercial law, inter alia, insolvency and company law, CCV. The second answer is presenting of lectures to final year students at the University of the Free State in insolvency law. Yes. Are you taking these insolvency law lectures out to the township? Because the question is not only the significance in relation to law, but the significance in relation to the pursuit of justice. Now, yes. insolvency is a big issue, certainly in where I come from. Do you take these lectures out to those communities that need your expertise in dealing with their day-to-day -day insolvency issues? Chief Justice, I have gave that lectures only for a certain period, I think it was three years, at the university. And at our university, I think uh, the composure was 70% black and 30% white in those classes. Um, because it was, they were the English and Afrikaans class were put together for that purpose when I gave lectures. That lectures had to be in English for obvious reasons. <clears throat> so um, I did not take it out to the townships. I did give it at the on invitation uh, at the university, and I think it reached um, at least the final year students because it was not only insolvency; they also ask questions like how is it to be at the bar and how is it to be a, an attorney? What would you suggest and what would you advise? So that's not only about insolvency. It was a general uh, 
lecture from the bar side uh, to to uh, those classes, um, which included about 70% black students. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Advocate Kormash. Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, Advocate Zitzman, there was a, a reply by you to, I think it was Commissioner Mulema, which stuck somewhere, I'm not sure where. But it's a very conventional, if not a more conservative approach to take to, upon a question who you should approach, that you would approach, you would appoint, or rather appoint the more experienced candidate of the three white candidates. And the reason why I, I'm asking it, because either it's a glib approach to who you think should be appointed, or it's a failure to understand what the criteria should be, because inter alia it would be experience, knowledge of different fields of law, technical skills, it would require ability to write judgments, whether you've got outstanding judgments, whether the potential to become a good judge, whether, in most importantly of all, we have embraced the values of the Constitution. So either it's a very glib approach, or it is a lack of fundamental understanding. And my concern is that it's hopefully not a conservative approach which you've taken, but <laughs> maybe in terms of what the Bar Council and how the Bar treats its members in terms of seniority from one to whatever, and that therefore the more experienced individuals normally the higher placed individual therefore should be elected or appointed. I'm giving you the opportunity to give your considered view at least to I think what was a more glib approach. To, uh, what right. was Let me first say, um, Chief Justice, uh, as far as just the last issue is concerned, it doesn't work at the bar that the most senior guy becomes the chairperson, firstly. I'm not the most senior guy. I think I'm fourth or fifth on, on rank. Secondly, I was put in a situation by Mr. Malema to, on a, to answer a certain scenario. And in, 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 in my view, the bench should, should firstly transform by way of color and gender. And secondly, we must remember that there must be also experience. And that's the reason why I answered it on that basis. Um, we can't uh, sidestep the experience part. That's why I answered it on that basis. But it is also important that we have transformation and gender equality. But with, without entering into a debate, experience in itself, there's people with three years' experience who made very little contribution to the law, development of law. So experience by itself is not the alpha and the omega. And, and that's the reason why I raise it with you. It's the most suitable candidate under the present circumstances that need to be appointed. Our experience in the law that's what I meant, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. But I mean, obviously, uh, my answer is only related to, on the basis to say there must be experience, firstly, in the law, and secondly, there must also be transformation and gender equality. And uh, luckily, I'm not the JSC, so I don't have to choose tonight, 16 candidates. And all I'm saying is, um, those are the criteria, and uh, that's how they should be chosen. Thank you, Commissioner Schmidt. Um, Advocate Zisman, thank you very much for your time. Um, Chief Justice. Um, you are excused now. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, thank, Commissioner. Thank you very much.